Praise the Lord! Woo! Hallelujah! I believe we're having church! Thank you so much, choir, for your faithful ministry. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I am so excited to welcome you to our concluding weekend of our World Missions Convention theme from here to everywhere. Solid Rock, we aim to proliferate the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? And I could not think of a finer speaker to be able to, to speak and challenge us this morning. His name is Dr. Mark Rutland. He is no stranger to Solid Rock. In fact, he and his precious wife, Allison, were here uh, over nine years ago and did a marriage conference that was just an absolutely roaring success. And so we're thrilled to have him here. But Dr. Rutland is a missionary at heart. He is an evangelist, an author, a leader among leaders. And he serves currently as the president of Oral Roberts University where he has served this incredible university since 2009. Prior to assuming his leadership role at ORU, Dr. Rutland was the president of Southeastern University of the Assemblies of God in Lakeland, Florida, where for 10 years God used he and his wife Allison in a wonderful way to transform not only the campus of Southeastern University, but also the lives of many young people who are out ministering the good news and serving Christ in, in secular vocations. Dr. Rutland has also served as a lead pastor of Calvary Assembly of God in Orlando, Florida. And he and his wife, Allison, founded Global Servants, a worldwide missions organization dedicated to spreading the good news of Jesus Christ, not only through the preached Word of God, but through compassionate ministries such as House of Grace in Thailand. He is a friend He's a preacher of the gospel. He is a man that I deeply appreciate and respect. And I'm so honored to have him address and challenge our hearts on our World Missions Convention. Would you please put your hands together and give it up for a dear friend, Dr. Mark Rodland. Let's welcome him to Solid Rock today. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. What an extravagant introduction. I, and my only regret is that my wife was not here to hear that. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. It's a joy to be here. I love this precious church, and I, uh, I just am so, um, I'm so grateful to be back with Pastor Bailey and his lovely family. And I, I said it in the first service, but I'll say it again here. I, I know that you know what you have. Uh, don't you know that you have a wonderful and precious pastor? I'm sure you're aware of it. I just love him. And I, I always feel this, if Pastor Bailey can just overcome this sad and withdrawn spirit and come out of his shell and overcome some of these inhibitions, I think he's going to be a great leader. Just, God, give him joy. That's what I'm thinking. Well, it's a delight to be here and to see all that God is doing uh, here at Solid Rock. It's great. Great to be in Columbus. We live in, uh, now in Tulsa, Jerusalem. But uh, yes. uh, even when I'm in Oklahoma, Georgia is on my mind all the time. I love it. Well, let me give you a couple of brief infomercials, if I can. The first for Oral Roberts University. Look us up on the internet at uh, oru.edu. We're a rapidly growing uh, university, a broad-based, comprehensive liberal arts university, 60-some-odd undergraduate degree programs that reach all the way from engineering and pre-med to ministry. Our pre-med program, by the way, if you're interested, has one of the highest admit rates of any university in the United States. The average admit rate from a university in the United States, admit rate means those who graduate from that university apply to medical school and are admitted. And uh, the average is about 49% of the students who graduate from a university and apply to medical school get in. The admit rate from Oral Roberts University is 89%. So we are very, very pleased with that. Uh, we have wonderful uh, colleges, six different colleges. God is blessing us there. We're growing. 
and it is a, it's a great, great time for us. Beautiful new buildings. Uh, five years ago, everybody knows about the crisis that Oral Roberts University went through. Uh, five years ago, Oral Roberts University was drowning in debt, $57 million in debt, $55 million in deferred maintenance. The campus looked uh, ragged and declining enrollment. And I would like to tell you that today, Oral Roberts University is 100% debt free. We have no debt against the university. In addition to that, we have done $45 million in deferred maintenance. The campus looks brilliant. You can get a pretty nifty shoe shine for 45 million bucks. The campus looks great, and we are under construction now on a beautiful $11.3 million student center. It will be open in January of next year. So in the middle of this coming academic year, we'll open a new 11 million plus building, and that building is paid for. It will have no debt against it. We have the money in the bank. So we're very excited about that. Enrollment is growing. It's an exciting time for us. Look us up on the internet at oru.edu. After I see the beautiful young people in this church, I'm thinking all of you, not some, not a few, all of you are supposed to be at ORU. I just, you know, that's just what the Lord has revealed to me. The other uh, brief infomercial has to do with global servants, to which your pastor has already made reference. Um, as the president of ORU, my salary comes from ORU, so it allows me to donate everything else to uh, the foreign ministry programs of global servants. There's a product table in the lobby of your church, books and CDs and DVDs and all kinds of things there. I don't take anything from that table at all. I don't take anything to speak here at this, uh, at this uh, church. All of those things go 100% to the foreign missions program at Global Servants. There's all kinds of books out there. I hope you will go to that table and spend yourself into bankruptcy because it accrueth not unto me. So I hope you'll enjoy it. I hope you will enjoy it. There are some books there that I think will be a blessing to you. But let's think about a worst case scenario. Let's suppose you buy a book and you absolutely hate it. Then send it to an enemy. <laughs> into every life a little rain must fall. I've spent my life as a discipline, as, as a student of the discipline of communication. I've studied communication in, in all of its aspects. I, I've spent my life studying linguistics and in, uh, and in um, radio, television, mass communication, in writing, uh, in speaking, uh, preaching communication, public, public speaking. And I, I've devoted myself to the study of communication. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Seems like if he's devoted himself to the study of communication, he'd be better at it. But you don't know how bad I might have been. And here's what I've learned. If you take the entire discipline of communication and boil it down to its quintessence, the cream that will rise to the top is simply four things. The right message to the right party in the right way at the right time. The right message to the right party in the right way at the right time. If you get any of those variables wrong, it can all go wrong, really wrong, really fast. I heard about a, a married couple. They had some unique coincidences in their lives. They were both born on the same day. And that's very rare. Most, very few married couples have the same birthday. Furthermore, they got married on their 23rd birthday. So their anniversary and their birthday was all the same. On their 40th anniversary, which would have been their 63rd birthday, they decided to take a second honeymoon. They went all the way to the South Pacific. They're walking on the golden sands of a beautiful South Pacific island when a bottle washed up in the surf. The wife picked it up and pulled out the cork, and out came a huge genie. And the genie said, it's your 63rd birthday, it's your 40th wedding anniversary, I'll grant you each one free wish. The wife never hesitated. She said, I know exactly what I want. I want a diamond ring bigger than Elizabeth Taylor's. The genie said, your wish is my command. And poof, just like that, on her finger, a rock. I mean a diamond bigger than the star of India, gleaming in the South Pacific sun. The husband, now inspired, said, I want my wish. 
The genie said, your wish is my command. He said, I want a wife who's 30 years younger than I am. And poof, just like that, he was 93. You can think that you're communicating, but the message that you transmit may not be the message that's received. Even if it is, the response that it elicits may not be what you had calculated on. Now, what is the communication problem of God? People think God has no problems. Sure, God has a world full of problems. It's us. What is the communication problem of God? It is that all the receivers are broken. The transmitter is perfect. The message is perfect. But the receivers are all broken. Every message of God, usward, is received through the veil of our own fallen humanity. So every time God says anything to us, anywhere at any time, he is constantly trying to push that message through the carnality, which is us, our own fallenness. We have difficulty communicating with each other in human languages. Let's see what kind of languages we have here this morning, okay? It's a foreign missions program. Let's just check ourselves. Let's see if there's anybody here that your primary language is other than English. Your, your, uh, your own primary language is other than English. Would you stand? Let's see who they are. Come on, just stand up. Anybody whose primary language is other than English. And your language is Spanish, la lengua celestial. Amen. You do not have to speak Spanish to go to heaven. You'll be given lessons once you get there, but you could avoid standing in that line. Amen. Y porque no es la lengua celestial. It's the heavenly language. Amen. Okay, let's see what we got back there. Okay, if, if your language is Spanish, then be seated. If your language is Spanish and yours is Korean, do you know, sister, I've been all over the world. I speak multiple languages. I do not know one word of Korean. So this morning, you've beaten me. So please be seated. Yes? Tagalog from the Philippines. Again, I know, the lang I know about the language. My father has some of the language, but he has stolen from me. And I do not speak it. You girls, be seated. If you think you speak a language that I don't speak, sit down now. No, I'm just... <laughs> All right, let's try back here. Hey, Hawaiian. Is that not a beautiful language or what? Mahalo. Aloha. Gras. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And right back there. Ibivio. From Nigeria. I, do you speak Igbo at all? No, I don't have a Bible. I can speak some Igbo. So I'm going to take that as a, as a substitute. Will you allow, allow me to do that? Thank you, sister. It, uh, Igbo is an interesting language, and the Igbo people are interesting. They're very aggressive people in life and business and other things, and everything that you say in Igbo sounds like you're mad at somebody. No matter what you say. So in Igbo, you might say, Chineke foro genanya, aforum genanya. That means God loves you, and I love you too. <laughs> okay, let's see. Who else? Is that it? All right. Well, and then we have the problem. Even people who speak English can't even communicate about half the time. Every married man in the room knows exactly what I'm talking about right now. Have you ever come to that moment, sir, where you have said something to your wife, and you can feel the ice cracking under your feet, you know that you have said the wrong thing and you have no clue what went wrong. Am I right? Any man here that's ever had that experience, raise your hand. Sure. And women, listen to me. Listen to what Dr. Elton's going to tell you. I'm going to teach you something. This is important. When you're, you say to your husband, what were you thinking? What, what, how many women have ever said that to your husbands? Raise your hand. What were you thinking? And you get that blank stare. He's not lying to you. A, he wasn't thinking, and B, if he was, he now no longer remembers it. <laughs> well, you say, what were you thinking? And he says, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you think he's lying, don't you? He's not lying. He's telling you the clear, honest-to-God truth. 
Well, what about, a, what about a communication where God speaks to somebody, speaks to them so clearly that it is so clear they're not confused about what God has said. They know what he said. They understand its application. And they look God right in the eye and say, I hear you. And the answer is no. That's pretty bold, isn't it? That is actually the story of the book of Jonah. I'm going to just read some selected passages from the book of Jonah. As I skip, I'll tell you so that you can follow me. Jonah chapter 1 and verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, or as we say in English, Nineveh, and uh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish. Tarshish is the ancient name of the modern country of Spain. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa or Jaffa or Yafo and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent a great wind into the sea so that there was a mighty tempest in the sea. So the ship was in danger of being broken. Now, if you will... Turn to verse 17 of the first chapter. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of that fish three days and three nights. Chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. Verse 10 of chapter 2. And the Lord spoke unto the fish and it vomited Jonah out upon dry land. Chapter 3. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Verse 10, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. Then, if you will, to verse 9 of the fourth chapter, and we'll read right to the end of that book. And God said unto Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd vine? And Jonah said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said, then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on a gourd vine, which thou hast not labored, neither madest it to grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And, I sh- and should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and also much cattle. Now put your right hand and your left on your Bible, and let's pray together. Padre bendito celestial, te damos gracias por tu presencia con nosotros en esta mañana. Porque te necesitamos mucho. Necesitamos un palabra de esperanza. Llena mi boca con tu palabra y úsame a su gloria si es posible. Glorifica tu nombre en este momento. Now let me pray for you in Tree, which is the language of the Shanti people in Ghana. Onyame. Medawasipa, Yesu ye radiampa, Medaw, Onawu ye konkron, Onawu ye fefefepa, Onawu ye mekonchefu, Medawasipa. Lord, we praise you. We thank you. We welcome your presence. We pray that you will overcome every barrier to communication. I thank you, Lord, that you speak every language of the earth. And that you can speak despite every age and gender and cultural and linguistic barrier into the inner person of every listener in this room. I thank you, God, that you're entirely fluent in Tagalog and Korean and that you speak every language of the world. I praise you for that. And I believe that you will overcome that and speak to our hearts in Jesus' mighty name, the strong Son of God. Amen and amen. Why why would Jonah look straight into the eyes of God and say, I hear what you're saying. You're calling me into a mission uh, trip, a mission venture to Nineveh, and I, I refuse to do it. I'm simply going somewhere else. There's some key verses in this story that need to be lifted up. One is this. Please look that it says, Jonah went down into a ship to flee from the presence of God. Jonah knew something that many church people forget, and that is that in the presence of God, you may not always be able to avoid his will and his word. 
There are a lot of people who are not Christians and not churchgoers who know that better than Christian churchgoers do. You ever have friends or associates who say, I'm not going to church because nothing happens. I'm not going to church. There's no God. I won't go to church because nothing's there. If that were true, they would not be intimidated about coming to church with you. But deep inside, they know that they run the risk of encountering the presence of God. And they know that if they get into his presence, they may actually hear from him and hear something they don't want to know. So that's the reason they will tell you they're not coming because God's not here. But actually, they're deeply afraid he's here. And I want to say something to you. Pastor, I'm not trying to run your people off. But you need to hear what I'm saying to you. It's not safe for you to be here. This is not a safe church. Every Sunday you get out of your car in that parking lot and start into those doors, there should be a lump in your throat. You should say, Ooh, anything could happen in there today. Because when we are in his presence, we may encounter his will and his word. Now the second thing is this. When he does encounter his will and his word, why does he dig his heels in? Why does he refuse? For the first answer, we don't need to look any further than the zoo of lust, which is our own hearts. The fact of the matter is, we are simply a fallen and rebellious race. There is something in us that just doesn't like to be told where to head in. I can prove this to you. Go out this afternoon and put a sign in your front yard that says, do not walk on the grass. Do you realize people will stop their cars? They will get out just to put one foot on your lawn and glare up at your house. What do you have to say to that? It's part of our, sort of our American mentality. That is to, that we, we, it's in our history. Don't tread on me, one man, one vote. Don't take my gun. You have to pry my cold, dead fingers off of my gun. Uh, and and it, that works in a republic. It works in a republic. And I'm, I'm there. I'm a patriot. But it doesn't work in a kingdom. Kings don't want you to vote about anything. And there can't be more than one king. If you have more than one king, you don't have a kingdom. You have a civil war. God is the king of the universe. Sovereign, omnipotent, Lord of the universe. And here's the funny thing about his job. He's not sharing. God expects to be obeyed. So when he speaks and calls us into obedience, that rebellious nature in us can rise up against that. Now here's the thing about, um, uh, about a uh, missions conference or missions festival. Now listen to this. In a little while, your pastor is going to come and talk to you about filling out your missions uh, faith promise. I'm a big believer in that. But remember, at its core, at its essence, a missions conference is not actually about money or about missions. It's actually about obedience. In the atmosphere of heightened sensitivity to God's will and his word, in his presence, as Jonah found out, God may speak to you about anything. You may pull out your ballpoint pen to circle $2,000 a month, $24,000 a year, and God may say to you, that's fine, go ahead and circle it. I'm ready for you to make that faith promise. But, he says, what I really want to deal with you about is forgiving and loving your mother-in-law. Now, that's real religion. And God may be dealing with us about anything in our lives. That's the reason that I said to you, it's not safe for you to be here this morning because you have invoked, invited, and received the promise of his presence. He's here, and he has the right to speak to anybody in the house about anything in their lives. Now, the second reason that Jonah doesn't want to obey God is not simply that he doesn't like being told what to do. He doesn't like what he's told. God says, go to Nineveh, that great city. At this time in history, Nineveh was the largest city in the world. Furthermore, it meant that it was the largest Gentile city in the world. It was not an Israeli city. It was not a Jewish city. 
It was a Gentile city. Jonah didn't want to go there. He didn't want to be around them. It was an unclean city. He didn't want to go in the city limits. He didn't want to walk around with them. He didn't want to talk with them. He didn't want to be with them or associate with them. He didn't want their Gentile cooties on him. He, he said, Lord, that's an unclean city. Do you remember that at one point somebody says about Jesus, there's never been a prophet to come out of Galilee? Do you remember that? That's not true. Do you know what prophet came from Galilee? Jonah. But he was not counted because he was not sent to any of the cities of Israel. He was a prophet to Gentiles. And that same mentality still existed. Jonah didn't want to be with him. Our worldview can become so parochial, so, so turned in on ourselves, our own denomination, our own local church, our own club, our own fellowship. It can become clubby and, and, and our eyes turned in on us. This is one of the things I like about Solid Rock. That's one of the reasons I started this message as I did. That you talk about go into all the world and preach the gospel. The whole world is at Solid Rock. This is a very international, very cosmopolitan, very, very diverse congregation. You're here, but you would be shocked and horrified to know how many congregations want everybody in the house to look the same, talk the same, speak the same language, and dress the same. And it can close your worldview in. It can happen in terms of mission. He runs. Now God has to break Jonah. He has to break him. There's more than one, more than one uh, evangelist, more than one pastor, more than one preacher that has to be broken. He, you know the story. The storm comes. He's thrown overboard. He's swallowed by the fish. Three days in the belly of the fish. Isn't it remarkable that in the belly of a fish, in the belly of the ocean, it still takes him three days to break? So he prays and says, okay, God, I'll do what you want. And God causes, I love the graphic language of the King James Bible. It says the fish vomits him up on the beach. Isn't that an interesting picture? So there Jonah says, okay, I'll obey you. Do you know is more than one preacher that has finally obeyed God when he was covered in vomit? And he says, now I'll go to Nineveh. And he does. Evidently, he showers first. And he goes to Nineveh and preaches, and there is an absolute revival. An absolute revival. Everybody in the, everybody in the city is converted to God. From the king to the lepers, the beggars, everybody in this, in this whole city, the largest city in the world, turns to God. The greatest revival in history is not what happened in the upper room. There were thousands of people saved, but everybody in Jerusalem wasn't saved. The greatest revival in history is the revival of Nineveh under the preaching of Jonah. The whole city repents of their sins and turns to God. Imagine if tonight the whole city of New York, not, that's not the biggest city in the world, not even nearly, but imagine if just the city of New York turned to God. From Mayor Bloomberg right down to the bums in Hell's Kitchen, everybody in New York turned to God. That would be on the front page of every newspaper from the New York Times to the Jerusalem Post. That would be on CNN. It would be the lead story. Fox would cover it fair and balanced. That would be everywhere. The greatest story in the world. New York turns to God. And Jonah got that. He got that. Was he happy about it? No. He was not happy about it. He went out and threw himself in the dust outside the city and said to God, I knew you'd do this. I told you you would do this. That I would come and preach and they'd repent and you'd forgive them. And I'm mad at you. And he lays there in the dust, in the sun, and God causes a gourd vine to grow up over his head and shelter him from the sun. Is he grateful? Of course not. He's just like we are. That's the least you could do. <laughs> that night, a cutworm comes and kills the vine. And Jonah says, perfect. This is what I've come to expect from God. And God says, are you grieving over a gourd vine? Are you grieving over a gourd vine? 
And Jonah says, yes, I'm grieving. I wish I was as dead as that gourd vine is. And God says, look, your priorities are out of order. He said, you grieve over a gourd vine. You didn't plant it. You didn't water it. You didn't fertilize it. You didn't cause it. And you didn't kill it. And it only lasted 12 hours. And you're grieving over that. And you won't grieve over the lost souls in the largest city in the world. So God is saying to Jonah, there's two different levels of obedience. The first level is the, the kind of uh, naked obedience that just does what it's told. A lot of people think that's highbrow Christianity. That's bargain basement Christianity. That's where we start to just do what we're told. But it can become a kind of uh, angry, begrudging obedience. I've spent my life around missions. I've been in every inhabited continent of the globe. I know missionaries from Dan to Beersheba. And I've met some of the most wonderful missionaries in the world. I've also met some of the meanest people in the mission world you would ever want to meet. And I have finally figured out what happened. They came to some high-powered mission service where somebody gave an altar call. And here comes this couple, kneels at the altar, and they say, okay, God's been calling us to go be missionaries in Africa. We're going. We're going. We don't love Africa. We don't love Africans. But we're going, we're going to obey God. You're bigger than we are. If we disobey you, you probably kill our kids. So we're going. We hope you're happy. Don't you know God is thrilled with that level of obedience? And hey, what about the Africans? I bet they're waiting with bated breath. Thank God the American church has sent us two more wounded, beat up neurotics to help out. No, what God wants is for us to hear his will as if we thought of it and receive it as our own and beg him for the opportunity to participate. So sometimes I hear pastors say something at missions. I do these missions conferences and your pastor has not said it and I, I bless you because it makes no sense to me. I hear pastors say, look, pray and if God tells you a number, to put on your faith promise, then put that number down and not one penny more. What's up with that? That makes no sense. Think about it now. That God says to somebody in this place, I want you to pledge $50 a month. And that person says, Lord, that's only $600. That's only $600. I, I want to go to $2,000. I want to go to $2,000. I'm going to write $2,000. And God says, oh, I'm mad at you now. <laughs> Give more than I say. Imagine that. Look, we are, aren't we parents? How many parents of teenagers are here? Will you raise your hand? Look at them raise their hand. Please try to say something helpful. <laughs> Look, isn't this right? Kids, Listen, how many of you have ever heard your, how many have ever heard your parents say, clean up the room? How many of you have ever heard, clean up the room? How many have heard it like every day, all your life, clean up the room? Isn't this right, parents? Listen to me. We don't want to simply say, stand at the door and say, clean up the room. Every day, next day, clean up the room. Next day, clean up the room. Next day, clean up the room. Clean up the flaming room. <laughs> That's not what we want, is it? What we want is for them to see that room the way we see it. Isn't that right? See, because kids, if you're, if you're content to live in that room, your parents are concerned about your fundamental humanity. So they want you to open the door of that room and say, oh my, this is a bit disheveled. I will set about to make it right. And the second part of that is this, listen. God doesn't just want us to obey, he wants us to, to be willing to go beyond, to go more than what's asked. That's where it becomes joyful. That's the reason that there are tithes, that's obedience. Your, your tithe is obedience. And offerings, offerings are beyond the tithe. That's where God delights in offerings because they're beyond, the tithe is the rule. You see, but the offering goes beyond. So I'm going to teach you. Where's, where's somebody over here that's about uh, 
15. Anybody that's 15, raise your hand. What's your name, honey? What is it? Annie. Perfect. Look up here at me, Annie. All these other people are here, but I'm talking only to you. Do your parents own a car? Yes. And someday, a year from now, you want to drive that car, don't you, baby? Nod your little head. Yes. You'll be 16. Someday you want to drive. You want your dad to give you the keys and let you drive that car. Isn't that right? You do. Okay, then Annie doesn't know. You, this, this little girl knows, right? You want that car. What's your name, babe? Amarissa. I'm going to teach you how to get the family car. Are you ready? Here it is. Is your daddy in the house? No. All right, then this is good. It's just between you and me. I'm going to teach you. Here it is. Someday... Your dad will say to you, will you please vacuum the house? If you just obey with a bad attitude, you don't get the car. You'll obey him, but it won't get you the car. Okay, I'm going to vacuum the house. But you've ruined my Saturday and my life. <laughs> that will not get you the car. What if he says, okay, I'd like for you to vacuum the house. And you say, sure. I'd love to. In fact, after I vacuum the house, I'm going to clean out the garage. Then I'm going to wash and wax your car. When you go down to visit him down at the coronary care unit, he's going to be laying up there under a big oxygen tent. But he'll have a smile on his face. And he will push the keys out from under the oxygen tent. And say, here, Amarissa, will you please drive your mother home? That's how you get the car. In other words, just going to Nineveh was bottom line obedience. But going with a rebellious attitude didn't fit the heart of God. So God says to Jonah... I don't just want you to do what you're told. I want you to feel what I feel. I want you to think as I think, to value what I value. And he says, your value system is all mixed up. He says, you're grieving over a gourd vine, and you're willing for everybody in the biggest city in the world to go to hell. He says, why can't you think like I think? That's what God wants of us is not simply to fill out the faith promise card because, okay, it's another missions conference, okay, let's fill it out, get Pastor Jay off our backs. <laughs> God says, I want you to feel what I feel. I want you to sense the possibility of being involved in a redemptive process that reaches around the world where we can touch people's lives with his healing grace. Now, I'm going to close with this. I want you to hear this. I'm going to tell this story, but I tell it always with mixed feelings because I don't want anybody to misunderstand the motive of telling it. But here it is. I've been in missions for years, decades. I preached in India and Australia and Europe and Asia and Africa and North America, all over the United States and Arkansas. And... I, I pretty much knew what I did. I pretty much knew what I did. I did evangelism. I trained pastors. We built churches. We built schools. I, I, I knew what we built clinics. I knew what we did. What I didn't do was children's homes. I didn't have any, I didn't, wasn't opposed to it. I just knew that wasn't God's calling on my life. Let other people build the children's homes. I was invited to come to northern Thailand and preach a crusade. Out of that crusade, we would take the people who got saved, Buddhist people who came to Christ, train them for two weeks, train a pastor, and set a church up all in, in three weeks. One week crusade, two weeks training and discipleship, ordain the pastor, and leave them. It's quite, a, quite an ambitious program. My first night in Thailand, I was in my hotel room about midnight when there was a knock on my door. I went to the door and there was a 
man standing there, a Thai man standing there with a small girl, a, a young girl, 10, 11, 12, something like that. She had her head down, her hands behind her back like this, and he spoke to me first in German. And I corrected him, I said, Nein, ich bin ein Deutschlander, I'm not, I'm not a German. Ich bin ein Amerikaner, I'm American. He switched to English, just like that. And he said, oh, that's good. He said, actually, my English is better than my German. So he said, I uh, want to uh, give you this little girl for the night. He said, I got her in a village uh, just yesterday in the north, and he said, I'm willing to certify to you that she's a virgin. He said, you give me $400 and take her in your room and use her all night. He said, whatever you want to do to her, that's up to you. I was just horrified. I mean, you can imagine, I had little girls. They, this little girl is the same age as my own daughters. I was just horrified. I said, are you crazy? You can't just walk up to my room like this and sell me a little girl. Are you out of your mind? I said, I'm calling the police. He laughed in my face. He said, let me call them. He said, I know them and you don't. He said, half of them are my relatives and half of them are on my payroll. He said, I can have you arrested and charged with any crime I want. He said, when prison, you'll go to prison for the rest of your life in Thailand. And he said, furthermore, I can reach you in prison. He said, I can have you murdered in prison with a snap of my fingers. He said, you're the foreigner here. You're the foreigner. He said, this is my country. And he put his hands on my chest and shoved me back in my room violently. And he said, now go back in your room, Farang. Farang, outsider, foreigner. Go back in your room, Farang, and shut your mouth. He said, there's nothing you can do about this. And he said, I'll sell this little girl before I get to the end of the hall. And he slammed my door in my face. I was shocked and horrified and angry and confused. And I just walked up and down in my room in impotent rage. I, I, I felt that he was right. I, I was a foreigner, that he could have me arrested. I, it could be the end of everything. And yet at the same time, I, had, I could see this little girl standing there with her head down. It just disoriented me. I know you, you are sitting there thinking oh, you would have been braver or you would have been... I just didn't know what to do. Finally, I just jerked the door open and ran out in the hall. I don't know what I thought I was going to do. Charge out there like Jackie Chan, I guess, and do something. <laughs> but they were gone. I've never seen that little girl again. And it haunts me to think what she went through. But I had breakfast the next morning with a Thai pastor, and I told him what had happened. And he was pretty blasé about it. He said, well, that happens here, you know. And, you know, and he told me about Asia's dirty little secret, which evidently everybody in the world knew about but me. The World Health Organization says in Southeast Asia, in the Philippines, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand is the epicenter. The epicenter of it is Thailand. He said, in so the World Health Organization says, in Southeast Asia, there are a million prostitutes under the age of 15. Most of them are virtually slaves. And he, this pastor was pretty blasé about it. Well, you know, it happens, and it's not a good thing, you know, that kind of thing. My American self-righteousness, I was outraged. I said, somebody ought to do something. Somebody ought to do something about this. You're just sitting there. I said, Wonder, somebody ought to do something. He took it for a little while. And then finally, he pointed his finger in my face and said something that changed my life. He said, you're somebody, aren't you? Somebody ought to do something. He said, aren't you somebody? And you know, for the life of me, I couldn't think of an answer to that. It plagued me. I finished the crusade. We did the church. I went home. I couldn't get it out of my mind. I talked to my wife about it. We wept together. We prayed together. And finally, we just went back to Thailand and started. We rented a flat, hired the wife of a local pastor. We took in our first four girls. Then it went to eight. Then it went to 20. Then it went to 30. We finally moved to an abandoned church camp, which we leased and fixed up at our expense. We went to 60. We realized it was not going to happen. Now, all these years later, that was 1987, all these years later we have two beautiful campuses, 14 buildings, about 120 girls, 
All of our staff are all graduates of the home. All the female staff are graduates of the home. They all came through. We have produced nurses and teachers and lawyers. We have one girl, Ape, who lives in Bangkok, and she is a lawyer in an international law firm owned from a firm in England, and she is practicing international contract law. When I was there last June, she told me that the Lord had revealed to her a vision to become a judge. Thailand has never had a female tribal judge ever, and God has told her that she has a dream of being a judge. The woman who runs our home was the first girl we took in. When she came to our house, she had never had on a pair of shoes. Just a little barefoot village girl. She couldn't even speak Thai. She could only speak her, her tribal language, Akka. Now she speaks three languages. She's got a bachelor's degree in accounting. And she and her husband run that home. Let me paraphrase that, actually. She runs that home. When she says jump, everybody on the campus jumps, including her husband. And she's the first girl we took in. But if you ask me, when did God call you to open House of Grace? That's where I have a problem. Because I'm, I'm not sure I was ever called. I never heard from the Lord. I didn't have a vision. I always envy these people who get these telegrams from heaven on the point of an angel's sword. I didn't, I didn't get anything like that. I never heard from God in prayer. I never, I never felt called. I just couldn't get that sentence out of my mind. Aren't you somebody? Now we are opened our second girl's home in West Africa. For we have 30 churches there, and now we've opened our second orphan's home, little girls in, in Ghana. But I never, I don't have a single moment where I say God called me to open girls' homes. Here's the thing. There are things that people are praying about, whether God wants them to do it. And God will not answer that prayer because he's already answered it. There may be somebody in this room whose next door neighbor is just as lost as a ball in high weeds. And you know it. You're not judging, but you know. They're lost. They're out of the church, out of fellowship. Their marriage is on the rocks. Their kids are in trouble. You know that they are addicted, burdened, wounded, lost. You know that. And you keep praying, God, should I go next door and witness to Bob? Should I go next door and witness to Bob? Lord, should I go next door and invite Bob to church? You're wasting your prayers. God's never going to answer that prayer because he's already answered it. He says, I answered that. So, what do we say to these things then? In all of these things, where God summons us to a specific moment of obedience, we can simply obey, or we can go beyond. We can say, Lord, I want to do more. I want to give more. I want to serve more. Or even beyond that, the third level, where we feel what God feels, where we sense His burden, His call, we don't even have to be told what to do. We simply feel about this situation the way God feels. And what to do becomes obvious. So in all of life, in all of the world, in all of the kingdom, you open some particularly nasty little closet of the world, and you can stand there and pray, God, what do you want me to do? God, what are you asking me to do? God, what should I give? You can stand there and pray till you turn blue in the face. Or you can just grab a mop and clean up. It's an unconventional view of missions. But I believe that God says, I don't simply want you to obey me and go to Nineveh. I want you to feel about Nineveh what I feel. And it will be clear to you what you're supposed to do. Well, let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this precious church. I thank you for their burden for world missions. I thank you that they have given more than a quarter of a million dollars. I'm praying, God, that their vision will increase, that you will lubricate their faith, that they will give more, go further, reach further than they've ever dreamed of, dilate their vision. I'm believing you for that, God. And bless back to this church all that they give, all that they sacrifice. And I know that you will do this, and I thank you for it in advance. In the wonderful name of Jesus.
the strong Son of God. Amen. God bless you. Amen. God bless Solid Amen. Rock. Amen. Amen. Would you welcome? Thank you. Express your appreciation to him. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rotland, for that challenge and speaking to our hearts and just really creating a slice into the heartbeat of God and his passion for those who are outside of the grace of God right now. But I want to ask you, beloved family, this morning, as we are concluding our World Missions Convention, I'm going to ask, and you know, the heartbeat of this church, a local church with a global heart. I'm going to ask if you'll just reach into your bulletin and, and pull out this faith promise card. I'm going to ask you just to look at that for just a moment because you see, beloved family, the whisper of the Spirit of God to us today is that will we hear and capture his heartbeat and feel his hurt for those who are outside of the family of God? Ultimately, the call of the kingdom is a call to reach the nations of the world. And God's calling us to be a part of that. To become a partner with God in the reaching of men and women and boys and girls all across this world with the good news of Jesus Christ. Hear me, dear one. And I know we pray this over our hearts and our lives. God, fill me with your joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. I pray that for you. I pray that in our services, that we will be so overwhelmed with the joy of God and the peace of God. But I want to tell you a prayer that really resonates in the heart of God. God, would you give me a sense of your hurt for this world, the lostness of humanity, the oppressed, the broken, the wounded, the outcast, and those who have just been thrown up on the, the waste heap of humanity. I want to ask if we will just start to pray, God, will you give me a sense of your hurt for people? It will revolutionize our hearts and our lives. I suspect it will revolutionize the way that we give because it's less about us and more about God and those that God weeps over. I want you to look at this faith promise card and for those of you who've never been into a, a world missions convention, not familiar with a faith promise card, it's simply an opportunity to say, God, I want to believe to do something extraordinary for you. I want to translate your extravagant love and I want to express it with extravagant giving. And I want my life and I want my resources to be used to help increase the footprint of your kingdom on this earth. Solid Rock, I'm going to ask you to listen to God. I'm also going to ask you to feel God's heart. It's the pathos of God, His passion for lost people. And God's going to choose to use us to be a part of that. Here are two goals that I have for us as a congregation. I'm going to ask that those of you who have never participated in this faith promise adventure, I would like to ask you to join us. I want to challenge you to join us. On whatever faith level you have, would you get involved with us with the first time? You see, beloved family, I want at least 200 people, 200 families that will say, you know, I'm going to be a part of this faith promise journey here at Solid Rock. Last year was about 150, and the 150 really helped to generate the majority of our faith promise giving. Last year, Solid Rock gave over 250, 250,000 towards world missions, and I'm grateful for that. But my first goal is to increase the breadth of involvement from this congregation. And you've never filled that one. Would you join us for the first time? Take that step. Just step out and believe God. But the second goal that I have for us, family, is really for the last couple of years, we've been wobbling around that quarter of a million mark. And I want to punch through that. I want us to break through that. And I believe the wherewithal here would allow us to accomplish that for the glory of God. I want us to, to surpass $300,000 in our faith promise giving, in our giving to world missions. And that means I'm going to need every one of you. Students, I'm going to ask you to join this adventure with us. I'm going to ask you to step out in faith and say, God, I want, I want to be a part of this. Those two goals, beloved, I think will help us to accomplish great things as we break out and break forth for the glory of the Lord. And let me tell you, Dr. Rutland's challenged us today. He's spoken prophetically into our hearts. 
And I want you to realize that whenever revelation has been revealed or truth has been imparted, then there is a requirement of an intentional response. We decide in our heart and say, God, I'm going to be used of you. And that's what this faith promise card is there for. Would you look at that for me right now? On that left panel, as you look at it, is an opportunity to identify yourself and your level of giving. On the right panel, it's, it's, a, it's a matrix to help you what you would do on a weekly basis, a monthly basis, and what that will translate over a year. Would you look at that? And I want you to make an, ex an exceptional step of faith with me, and we will do it. In fact, we did that in our first service this morning. And I want you just to, to join with us, family. As we say, God, we will be a local church with a global heart. And we will allow our lives to become the fingerprints of heaven that we will stretch all across. You notice our theme from here to everywhere? That's unique to us, family. It's not the Assemblies of God annual theme. That's unique to us from here to everywhere. That solid rock will become that nexus. It'll become the hinge through which the door of world missions would swing in terms of God's plan for our lives. And that solid rock will really be able to have an influence all across the continents of this world. I want to ask you to join with us. Would you do that? Would you take a pen? If you need a card, would you lift your hand? There, there should be one in that bulletin. Ushers, if you would just come and hand those out for us. Thank you so much. Just lift your hand wherever you are. Pull out that card. If you need a pen, they have a pen. We are well ready to serve you. We have come armed to this service. Lift your hand if you need a card. Thank you. Then I'm going to ask you just to take a moment with pen in hand. I want you to fill out that left panel. Identify yourself. And then if you'll just fill out that amount that you'd like to be able to invest in the kingdom of God. I realize some of you may want to talk to your spouses about it. And, you know, typically we have these cards turned in even a few weeks after. But together, beloved, what we cannot do unilaterally, we can do collectively as a body together I want to pray over us but just take a moment right now just to fill out that left panel and identify that amount and then in a few moments I'm going to invite you just to come in fact if you fill that out as we sing this you can place it on the altar as a gift as a as really a covenant before the Lord that I'm going to step out in faith and I'm going to become a partner with solid rock and the kingdom of God Father God, today we love you. Today, Lord, we realize that, that you're calling us to make a difference. You're calling us not to be a reluctant Jonah, but to be an exceedingly responsive Jonah. That say, Lord, here I am, send me, and through my life we will see many one into the kingdom of God. Father, would you emblazon upon our hearts and our minds? Would you brand us with a passion for lost men and women? Will you somehow, Lord, etch into the consciousness of our minds and unto the tables of our heart a burden for lost nations? Even now, we will bless you and we will honor you and we will respond joyfully to the call of the kingdom. Thank you, Lord. We give you the praise. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Would you sing that, Pastor Tim and team? And just fill out that card, beloved. And when you're ready, would you just step out and come and bring it to the altars and then return to your seat as we worship the Lord together. We bless the name of the Lord. Jesus.